How's it going everybody? So in this video we're going to be talking about everybody's favorite subject, longevity. Okay, How can we use nutrition, exercise, and maybe supplements and other modalities to increase our lifespan, maybe even to that of a super centenarian, meaning having our life last over a hundred years like, you know, the legendary Okinawans that we always hear about or the blue zones in the island of Crete and Costa Rica and then the highly controversial Seventh-day Adventist group in Loma Linda, California. And of course the lesser known Mormons uh, in the United States and uh, various other populations that eat a, heavy, a heavily animal-based diet with no plant foods that we don't really hear too much about. Uh, how can we increase our lifespan to the greatest extent possible? How can we improve our longevity? So uh, I love this topic a lot because the vast majority of people are thinking about it from the point of what we call the nirvana of health syndrome. They're looking at it from a place uh, that's not grounded in reality, not grounded in actual research regarding hard uh, facts and tangible hard health outcomes, okay? Meaning basically uh, actual people eating actual diets, getting actual results and outcomes that are conducive to the goal and intention in which we are intending to embark upon and inflict upon ourselves, okay? So let's uh, kind of get in the meat and potatoes. So first of all, okay, um, what are some common things that people think about when they think about trying to exercise for longevity and trying to eat, you know, nutrition for longevity? So most people who are not informed, who are not actually reading the scientific literature and interpreting it properly, people who are usually persuaded by uh, experts who are trying to sell you, you know, supplements and superfood powders and, um, you know, complicated spiritual yoga experiences, uh, they'll really get you to buy into all of this stuff that doesn't have any real kind of effects on longevity or health outcomes. So, you know, like, again, people get involved in things like uh, eating lots and lots of greens, juicing kale, uh, uh, super green powders, um, what else? Things like uh, turmeric supplements, um, uh, even drugs like metformin are really popular in these longevity gurus um, routines now. You know, expensive mitochondrial supplements. People get into uh, cellular detoxing, which is not even a thing. Uh, obviously things like yoga and um, corrective exercise and what else um, cleanses colon cleanses you know and <laughs> uh, intermittent fasting which as far as I'm concerned can be beneficial but uh, people will get into col uh, calorie restriction protein restriction and these uh, behaviors that are not supported by actual exper experiments with a high magnitude of effect uh, on actual human beings. Uh, protein restriction, caloric restriction, and things like that, and focusing uh, deeply on, you know, super greens and polyphenols and things like that, uh, first of all, have not been shown at all. There's zero evidence whatsoever that those things have a meaningful effect on longevity or even uh, just metabolic health markers that we can measure. That's the first thing. The second thing is caloric restriction and protein restriction um, actually can have a pretty severe negative impact past of course the effects on fat loss if you're losing fat and you're you know and you're at a unhealthy body fat percentage level then obviously caloric restriction is going to uh, cause you to lose body fat and improve your health markers and eliminate the primary causes of disease under the age of 65 
But if you're at a healthy body weight and you're trying to do intermittent fasting and caloric restriction because you think that it's going to make you live longer, uh, you can run into a lot of pretty bad issues. Most importantly, being in a net catabolic state where your body's breaking down muscle tissue uh, and bone mass in order to compensate for your lack of nourishment coming in. And that's just starving yourself is not good in that regard or, you know, in any regard. But let's kind of – so that's that's what longevity – Nutrition and exercise for longevity really is not, okay? So I want to caution people against that. Uh, and I want to give another kind of um, – what's the word? I want to give another kind of uh, disclaimer. Disclaimer is that, um, first of all, the vast majority of the protocols that people are going to freak out at me in the comments over. Like I'm going to get people telling me, haven't you heard of David Sinclair? And his book, Lifespan, haven't you heard that metformin will do this and that, caloric restriction, mTOR, blah, blah, blah. Almost none of these things that people think contribute to longevity have any real hard evidence that it's going to do anything positive whatsoever. Okay, And furthermore, in nutrition science and health science, we, are, uh, we have to draw, con draw our opinions and beliefs based on inferences if you don't know what inferences is you need to google search it before watching this video uh, especially before leaving me a comment telling me i'm full of crap uh basically we can only make our best judgments based on the evidence that we do have most people who are emotionally charged about longevity and think uh, all these crazy protocols are going to help them uh these gurus that push these things like David Sinclair, for example, they're using studies and research done on on rats, done on isolated rat colons, you know, taking like a, 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 my, a molecule produced uh, from bacterial fermentation in the intestine and then injecting it into an isolated rat lung or something crazy like that to find to see what the reaction is in a test tube study. And then like trying to deduce that or trying to uh, extrapolate that to human experience makes no sense. And then using large observational trials over decades of free living populations and using, um, you know, a gigantic list of different variables that you test for and then trying to correlate those variables to the health outcomes in these populations of people. You just you just can't do that. Like you you cannot like you cannot take those studies, uh, and they almost never have, like they have like okay what like a one one to two like not even a two percent difference in in health outcomes and absolute risk of diseases. The magnitude of effect of these studies are so small. You get like a like a zero point one percent difference in studies of hundreds of thousands, in many cases, millions of people, and trying to take these large data sets with all these ver these confounding variables, these, these uh, lingering variables that are, cannot be controlled for, okay, viruses in the, in, in the environment, um, the, the quality of air, uh, the quality of their water, um, you know, the, the wide variety of, of factors in their nutrition – that can't be accounted for that we know influence the quality, you know, the, the outcome data. There's just so many uh, things in these studies that can't be accounted for. And then we take these large data sets, observational studies, cohort studies, et cetera, with that can that, that have such, you know, and we're like, Oh look, a 0.1% relative, uh, a 0.1% reduction and re and relative risk of heart disease from, you know, eating eight cups of vegetables a day. Like, really? <laughs> you know, the percent, the percentage of, of, uh, of benefit that you see in these studies are so small that even in the context of these studies, they're not significant. They make no sense. Uh, so anyway, let's move past that. So, yeah, so let's talk about the things that actually, that actually do have evidence behind them.
the first thing is uh, before the age of 65, the leading causes of death are metabolic health related. Okay, so things that we can measure on blood tests usually. And it's heavily debated on what blood tests we need to measure to kind of use as a proxy for these diseases. But things like uh, diabetes, okay, diabetes, um, you know, heart attacks, uh, and cancers, for example, okay. And whether you want to believe cancer is a metabolic, uh, a disease related to metabolic health or not is up to you. I would recommend you uh, become very familiar with the work of Professor Thomas Seafried, PhD, who's leading the field in the future of oncology research. Um, but basically, people tend to die below the age of 65, okay, on average from diseases that are lifestyle related, heart disease, diabetes, um, it's metabolic health markers, okay? Uh, things that we can measure through continuous blood glucose monitors, hemoglobin A1C tests, um, fasting insulin tests, and then tracking blood pressure. Uh, and, you know, people mistakenly assume blood pressure is only related to sodium. Or smoking, but in fact, blood pressure is related to a lot of different things, but chronically elevated blood pressure is most closely associated with uh, severe insulin resistance, okay? And in general, almost all of these diseases can be prevented through a wide variety of basic nutritional strategies and exercise, obviously, or just nutrition, Um Type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance, just energy restriction in general is is the key here. Whether you are following a uh, calorically restricted, uh, um, you know, vegan diet, okay, because there's a lot of people that use that as a golden standard and they think that saturated fat clogs, uh, clogs the, the insulin receptor or the glucose receptor, and that just is shaky to me. But then there's people, obviously, and there's a lot of uh, uh, clinicians and, and, and large medical organizations that use uh, low-carb diets like ketogenic diets, Atkins diets, paleo diets to, uh, to put diabetes into remission. The point, though, is that nutrition strategies, whether it's just basic uh, macro counting, uh, you know, caloric restriction – whatever, vegan thing, whole foods, whatever. Energy restrictive diets can completely put type 2 diabetes into remission. Um, how you do that is up to you and, and, and what type of diet you think is better and the cause and all that is up to you. The point is, though, that's, you know, it, one of the biggest kind of causes of most diseases in our society that I can see is dysregulation and energy, okay? Uh, obesity. Right, uh, excessive body fat levels are caused by an excess of of, of energy coming in. Okay, there's a lot of weird there uh, ideas about ATP and calories and, and this and that, but most people know you eat too much uh, fat or you eat too much carbohydrates or whatever, uh, too many calories, you get excessive body fat. Okay. So what I'm trying to say here is before we can even talk about how to live to 100, we have to make it a 65. And 65 is used as a cutoff point in evidence due to the average of studies and the different types, the different causes of death as lifespan continues. Okay? So, so that's the first and most important thing is, look, uh, when we're talking about longevity, the most important thing is being sure that your lifestyle is conducive to preventing heart disease, insulin resistance and diabetes, and high blood uh, pressure problems, and then uh, also things like cancers. And cancer is more of a gray area, you know, because in my opinion, there's hormonal cancers, and then there is, um, uh, I'm going to say, insulin resistant or insulin dependent cancers. Uh, that's a whole nother story to get into. Uh, and insulin is hormonally, you know, and do, you know, so anyway, whatever. Okay. So here's the thing past the age of 65, 
the leading cause of death starts to change. And the older you get, the older you get, the more and more the main, the primary causes of death start to trend in the other direction. Okay. So past the age of 65, we're dealing with um, diseases of robustness. Okay. Uh, mostly malnourishment is what it really looks like. So, uh, past the age of 65, the leading causes of death are, um, hospitalization or complications due to hospitalizations from tragic falls, hip fractures, and a lack of self-sufficiency. And the older you get, the more and more the, your, your, your causes of death are relating to your ability to be independent. Okay. So not only are the leading causes of death, uh, uh, based on your, your physical robustness, right? Your ability to, uh, you know, first of all, not fall. That's based on what we know is pre operioception, our body and our nervous system's ability to move through our environment and, uh, effectively. You know, to catch ourselves before we fall, to not fall, to have better balance and stuff like that, to get up out of the chair in the morning, our chair in the morning, get out of, out of bed in the morning, be able to walk around, go up and down the stairs without being exhausted. The majority of humans on this earth already, you know, even in, in, the, in their 20s, can't even go up and down stairs without, you know, uh, breathing heavy, right? Um, people wait 30 minutes to like, uh, get a parking space at the very front of the grocery store parking lot. It's crazy. And they can't even endure like a little bit of heat, you know, 75 degrees outside in their sun and they're like dying. You know what I mean? So anyway, uh, point I'm trying to make though is so, so there's that the, the disease is related to things like bone mineral density. Okay. A lack of like a lack of bone mineral density contributes to uh, hip fractures. Hip fractures is a major cause of death, or, or 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 root cause leading to the causes of death in the hospital. Hip fractures, and hip fractures generally don't happen from basic falls unless your bone mineral density starts to trend towards the lower end of the reference range. So there's that. Um. So the other thing we know is uh, success and health into old age. Okay, so longevity, longevity. Okay, what are the things in the in the, in the research that are most strongly associated with longevity? Uh, muscle tone, basically, basically muscle mass. Where they say muscle tone, uh, grip strength. Okay, a lot of people probably heard that. Uh, bone mineral density, obviously. Uh, and of course, like lower back strength and things like that, uh, but basically muscle tone, um, bone mineral density, grip strength. Like you hit, you'll hear these, these things are the big ones that are associated with longevity in a positive fashion. And now I'm going to say something very controversial. Okay. Uh, but, um, the other thing is LDL levels. Okay. Now this one's very controversial, but, uh, Lower LDL levels, and this the this seems that there's a there's a large uh, data set that's uh, that's been uh, collected by uh, the World Health Organization and a couple of other uh, large uh, 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 health authorities that um, and it hasn't been published for whatever reason. I don't know why it hasn't been published. Uh, that actually shows there seems to be a dose-dependent response in the lowering of LDL uh, in old age, people past the age of 65, and the in an increased risk of all-cause mortality, where the lower LDL goes, the higher your risk of dying from all causes. And so, and it, and to me, it's really strange how everyone uh, hyperfixates on. Um, LDL being a, you know, playing a causal role or being a, 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 a very uh, uh, strong proxy for heart disease um, based on, you know, fil uh, familial hypercholesterolemia studies and statin drug studies, you know, and that's like their best evidence that LDL seems to play a causal role in heart disease, supposedly, where they say higher LDL 
means higher, more higher heart disease risk, but they completely, you know, and those are not like necessarily reflective of what happens in healthy human beings without these genetic polymorphisms or they're not on statin drugs. And by the way, uh, statin drugs also, you will see, you know, they supposedly you see a slight reduction in the instances of heart attacks over time uh, with people who have already had heart attacks but take statins. Uh, but at the same time, you see an increased risk of dying from all, from all causes, but specifically from Alzheimer's uh, and dementia-related illnesses. You know, so, you know, to me, that is in alignment with also this data set that I'm talking about that shows, again, as you age, uh, higher LDL actually seems to play, uh, seems to be associated with a positive, uh, with positive health outcomes. Higher LDL seems to be associated with greater health and older age, and the reverse is also reflected in this data set. Now, I am not saying that LDL uh, increases lifespan, and I am not saying that um, having low LDL is necessarily going to kill you. Uh, I'm just saying that that data set exists, and it's a pretty significant, it, it's a gigantic set of data, and the uh, the statistical significance is is magnitudes higher than what you'll see in some of these other uh, freaking population studies that I mentioned in, earlier in this video. So I'm just saying that that exists. Look into it and do what you will with it. But that's important and that's relevant, um, especially considering a lot of the foods that people would commonly eat that increase LDL levels are usually higher in protein or contain higher uh, or come with higher protein things like eggs and meat and things of that nature and milk but not always so anyway um, so what are we looking at here okay we're looking at strength okay strength training increases bone mineral density strength training increases muscle mass okay um, High protein diets, uh, so high protein diets have actually been shown to increase the absorption of calcium in, 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 in the gut. Uh, higher protein diets also contribute amino acids to every single process that's required for healthy human life. Uh, so things like your endogenous antioxidant system, so glutathione, superoxide dismutase, these are our body's primary defense against uh, uh, to, to, to create apoptosis, the turning over of cancer cells, to build glutathione in our, you know, in, or yeah, yeah, to uh, uh, fight off viral infections and things like that, to help the body um, create enzymes and things uh, for removing environmental toxins and things uh, removed via the NRF2 pathway. Those are relying on amino acid dependent enzymes um, and so there's there's a wide variety of things in our body that are highly dependent on amino acids another thing is uh, there are studies that exist where you have two groups of people you have one group of, uh, of people who eat the regular protein intake about half their body weight in grams of protein and then you take another group they took another group of people and doubled their protein intake where they're eating twice as much as, as usual via protein supplementation actually and uh, they both don't add any exercise or do any resistance training they're living sedentary lives already that's equated for and they actually see a, a significant increase in muscle mass in the group who is eating uh, who just doubled their protein intake without adding any resistance exercise at all and this was a uh, I think a six-week study that's pretty significant in six weeks to see a noticeable increase in muscle mass uh, via lean mass scan, of course. I believe it was a DEXA. And to me, that, that demonstrates that, you know, it, that's without resistance training. That demonstrates that the body is wanting to retain a, or, or to create a certain amount of muscle mass based on what we do every day. And a lot of people... Um, that their daily activity is placing demands that require more muscle mass to sustain their energy output. 
but they're not giving their body the raw materials, the amino acid and, and, and the protein intake to help support their daily activities. So if you think about that, the body's trying to create muscle tissue from just your everyday activities, even if it's an office job. And when in these studies where they give them protein, uh, they double their protein intake and they don't add any resistance training, their body grows muscle tissue just from their daily activities and the increased muscle, uh, the increased protein intake. Imagine the effect that that's going to have over the lifespan, especially past the age of 65 when our leading cause of death is dependent upon our ability to, to not fall, our ability to be strong enough to like walk around during the daytime, not have a uh, uh, muscle br or sorry, bone breaks and things. And, um, basically to increase your lifespan, having adequate protein intake is number one. It's number one. And it's supported by, by hard clinical outcomes, not observational evidence, but like what actually happens to people when they get older. And you see this all the time. What is the number one complaint people talk about as they get older, especially in people that don't train or that train improperly? Like, oh, I have joint pain. I have knee pain. Uh, uh, the, the freaking connective tissue in my knees, okay? Look, collagen is dependent on amino acids to synthesize. So if you're having connective tissue issues, a lot of times that's because you're not giving your body the raw materials it needs to create the collagen to support your, your, your uh, connective tissues, your knees, your elbows, tendons, ligaments, etc. And you get that from a higher protein diet, okay? Um, so strength training. So a lot, there's a huge negative connotation surrounding strength training. And people think if they just do bird dogs and core training and uh, little high intensity interval circuits and yoga and Pilates and this and that, they think that that's what longevity is all about because they, you know, I don't even want to get too deep into this. So you see all these gurus on TV that try to sell you this idea that you need to uh, transcend your Kundalini, you know, it's yoga terminology and uh, rise to the promised land of the spirits and all this, all this stuff. This is like, uh, infatuation is what it is. It's like mental fantasies about what the idea of, of long, healthy living, you know, people, we have these Kung Fu films with these, uh, these, these, uh, Kung Fu masters full of wisdom and spiritual potency with their long beards and this and that. I, I did shell in for like five years and these legends and stuff that are actually not reflective of reality. Um, when the evidence supports the idea that robustness as we age is the most important thing. Okay. And so you can do all the yoga you want. You can drink Kel smoothies. You can follow a protein restricted diet. Cause that's what's being promoted in the longevity communities these days. And they take metformin to, you know, cause they think it's going to like increase their lifespan without negative consequences. And there's some people that also take statins to increase their lifespan and encourage it. Uh, you'd be surprised at the things that, that you see in these communities. And of course there's reservatrol supplementation, which is, which we now know is a complete, completely bad idea to supplement reservatrol, which is, you know, the polyphenol that is found in red wine that people wrongfully assumed was associated with red wines, supposed magical benefits on, on health and whatnot that supports the blue zones in Crete and, and the Mediterranean diet and whatnot. But, uh, it actually has the opposite effect. Uh, just like most polyphenols and antioxidant supplements that we find in the research tend to increase your rate, your risk of can of various cancers, uh, tend actually resveratrol tends to be uh, slightly estrogenic. And uh, there's a lot of issues with resveratrol that we now know about. A lot of people that were advocating it previously and were, were, all, were like insisting that the research was clear now have gone back and they're like making videos. Why well, don't supplement resveratrol anymore? And I was wrong. And it's like, do we, do we, do you really think taking an isolated polyphenol? Never mind. I'm not going to get too deep into that, but instead of focusing on all these crazy, like more, stressful things, supplementing these things that we don't know, have much data on free living populations of people living long lives. Don't supplement these things. 
You never hear these centenarians that are interviewed. You know, there's a lot of interviews we could use. They never say, oh, I supplemented Reservatrol and that's why I live it. No, they say other things. What I've seen so – and this I'm just saying. I've seen so many of these uh, centenarians insist that it was – you know, the couple of ounces of red meat that they eat per day or the couple of raw egg yolks they say they ate. Some of them claim whiskey and cigarettes, which we're going to get into in there in a little bit. Uh, but anyway, uh, the biggest commonality among most centenarians is that they are still gardening. They are still doing their daily activities. If you listen to the interviews, they are still active. They are in better physical fitness shape. They're more self-sufficient than the vast majority of even 40-year-olds nowadays that spend most of their life sitting all day, watching TV, working, sitting, and ordering all their groceries from like these online delivery services. They hardly do any kind of physical activity at all. And we know what chronic bed rest does to bone mineral density, to muscle tone, and to our metabolic health. Legitimately, all the things that really matter for longevity are, are dependent upon putting your bones under stress, putting your cardiovascular system under stress, putting your muscular system under stress, and giving your body the raw materials that it needs to repair and rebuild those systems. And remember, I'm not even getting into polyphenol supplements, new, uh, vitamins, minerals, nutraceuticals, tonic herbs, okay? We're going to get into polyphenols here in a little bit, though. But for longevity and for health in general, it's um, taking care of your metabolic risk factors. And they're in, completely dependent on how much energy am I expending versus how much energy am I consuming, and then the, the, um, the total amount of building blocks I am given, the, the protein, the amino acids, and then whatever carbohydrates or fats that you are depending on as an energy source, and the nourishment that comes with that. Because there's nutrients and fat, vitamin E, vitamin K2, uh, vitamin D, believe it or not, vitamin E. All of those are actually found in, well, in animal fats. Uh, vitamin A, um, but then of course you have things like uh, magnesium, potassium, and and vitamin C, and some of these other things, selenium, molybdenum that are found in a lot of whole carbohydrate sources. So, anyway, um, nourishment is important, but giving your body the building blocks it needs to support robustness is even more important. All right. So, so we've got the, the most important things taken care of. Those have hard evidence on, legitimately hard evidence, okay? And, and one more thing, strength training, okay? Look, people think that if you, if you do strength training that you're going to injure yourself, that there's wear and tear that accumulates. It's false, okay? If you have, a, if you have the wrong trainer or you're lifting – if you're doing strength training wrong – then that can cause pain and injury because you're not doing it right. The fact is you don't need to train to failure in order to improve your strength levels and your bone mineral density over time. What you do need to do, though, is lift at a certain percentage of your body's maximum capa uh, capability. Heavy lifting is not absolute. Okay, 400 pounds squat is not heavy. What I mean by that is what's heavy to me is different from what's heavy to you. It's relative. We know that in the, science, in the strength literature or in the, in the exercise science literature as relative intensity versus absolute intensity. What you have to make sure is that the weight is heavy enough for you relative to your maximum capability so that it's challenging enough. It's within – the right percentage of your one rep max to put your bones and your muscles and your body under enough stress to facilitate the uh, the strengthening of the ligaments, the, the connective tissue, the collagen, the muscles, the bones, the nervous system. 
your body actually increases its uh, its uh, its resistance to adrenaline and stress hormones. Believe it or not, from high intensity strength training, uh, you actually build stronger knees, stronger elbows, stronger bones, stronger muscles, stronger nervous system, stronger stress response, stronger immune system too. From strength training. You burn more energy at rest, okay? Um, you gain more muscle tissue, which also burns more energy, more calories, etc. You become more insulin sensitive from strength training for more muscle tissue. So you're, you're knocking off all of the risk factors that usually kill people at any age level, okay? Below the age of 65, insulin sensitivity blood pressure, heart disease, all these things that are related to it. Even cancers, many cancers related to insulin sensitivity. The, uh, the more muscle tissue you have, the stronger you are, the more insulin sensitive you are, the, the more calories you can eat, the more energy you can eat uh, without gaining excess uh, body fat, okay? You're, you're, you're resolving the majority of the metabolic risk factors that we can actually measure below the age of 65 that usually kills most people off by doing strength training and eating a, a, a adequate protein diet. Okay. And then after the age of 65 bone mineral density, well, we're strengthening that through strength training. You could actually, you actually, you actually see inches on, on, on people's wrists and ankles. Okay. And that's dependent on genetics as well. But you will see pretty significant increases in, in bones from strength training. The problem is people will do things like machines and things, uh, and they'll do it to failure. They, do, they kill themselves with strength training, uh, training to failure, super high, high reps. A lot of times their form is all over the place. They have no real programming and progressive shame. Uh, or they go, they go so heavy – that their body's not used to that 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 level of, of strength yet, and it's beyond their body's uh, maximum threshold of adaptation, to the point where their body cannot tolerate the load. Okay, so that's how people get injured and you get aches and pains over time. But if you know how to train properly, you train with a couple of reps in reserve at a certain rate of perceived exertion. You know, and you're not like running crazy miles that you haven't adapted to yet and built up over time. Whatever it is, you're not going to have aching knees and all this other stuff. So it's about building the body through proper training and nutrition. And that's, that's what Jack LaLanne, Jack LaLanne, one of the pioneers in the fitness and health world, was all about. Physical robustness. And his wife as well. Uh, La La LaLanne. <laughs> so... Um, let's see. All right. So now let's talk about polyphenols because most people, they completely skip all of the things I just mentioned. And by the way, cardiovascular training is very important as well. Don't get me wrong. Um, but, um, people skip all of these things and they go straight to the kale smoothies and they're like, look, if you want to live a long life, eat your greens, get your chlorophyll, you know, get all your polyphenols, get your glucoraphanin, get your curcumin, your gin gingerol, uh, you know, get your saponins, whatever. And limit protein, they tell you. They'll tell you that. They'll tell you <laughs> all these things. They'll say, you know, do strength training, but you can, only, you can only do strength training twice a week because otherwise you'll cause overtraining. Look, if you eat enough calories and protein – Overtraining is generally a non-issue unless your training is just crazy. <laughs> like, and that's a very common thing. People, oh, I'm, get, I, I'm getting old and I can't strength train because I have injuries from strength training. No, no, you have injuries from not training properly. That's how I rehab uh, injuries, though, and, and pain issues. Pain goes away when you start to load progressively to, to tolerance using pain as your guide. Strength training is the ultimate anti-aging tool along with protein. By the way, my recommendations for protein is to get it from whole animal foods and uh, 
eat enough protein from whole animal foods to where you're getting your ideal body weight in grams of protein from. If you get that level of protein from whole animal foods, you're getting the vast majority of your essential nutrients, B vitamins, fat soluble nutrients, and even vitamins and minerals, provided you're not like eating it super dry or whatever, to sustain life for decades. And on top of that, if you get fruits, okay, fruits as a primary carbohydrate source, you're getting a lot of the nutrients that meat does not provide. B1, uh, folate, um, magnesium, potassium, uh, you know, stuff like that. Vitamin C. And then, of course, whatever polyphenols and fiber that you think you need. And if you want to eat uh, grains and stuff after that's kind of been sufficient, then cool. Also, if you believe that LDL is a, is a risk factor for heart disease, and you want to limit your saturated fat, by all means, eat lean meat. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it doesn't have to be this thing where you're like, oh my god, I don't want to die of heart disease, all the saturated fat in meat. Look, if you eat super lean cuts of meat, steak or chicken, breast or whatever, if you eat, um, you know, whatever, lean fish, whatever it is, look, I don't recommend that, but uh, you're still hitting a lot of markers and basically getting the purpose of my kind of idea. All right, so let's talk about polyphenols. Um, first and foremost, polyphenols have not been shown conclusively in the research to provide much of any widespread generalized benefit whatsoever. They are not a magical uh, thing that you should intentionally include in your diet without specific reasons why. Now, I will tell you for sure. So you can't judge polyphenols by their classification or, you know, whatever. They're magical, this and that. Every single polyphenol, phytonutrient or, or plant-derived nutrient that doesn't have like a essentially required uh, component in the diet, they have various things that they do. A lot of these polyphenols act as kind of like pharmaceutical medications in a way. Some of them have very potent medicinal properties. So, for example, there is an antibiotic compound that has been identified in garlic known as allicin. Allicin, okay? Or allicin. And basically, when you chop up the raw garlic and you let it sit for 10 minutes, it becomes really strong and it gives you that burning sensation on your tongue. The allicin content is activated in other byproducts as well, similar to... Uh, raffinose and glucoraffinin and things and endol, endol 3 carbonyl and these compounds in broccoli that are released after you chew them. The same thing happens in garlic when you chop it up. And so basically, uh, the allicin, the anti, it, it has antibacterial properties and it was used, for example, I think it was World War I, the Russians used raw garlic at, when they ran out of penicillin. And it was known as like Russian penicillin. Um, but it's been identified, it's been verified in intervention trials and mechanistic studies. And uh, for me, that's what I use. If I ever have any kind of bacterial issue, which I haven't actually been sick in over eight, it's been definitely over six years now, but I think it's closer to eight that I've been seriously sick with any kind of cold or anything like that at all. At all. <laughs> Especially for longer than three days. But if I do get cold symptoms, I break out the raw garlic. So, but that's just an example of like a, a compound that's found in, uh, in the plant food, like raw garlic. It has medicinal properties, and that's an application. Another one would be, um, so you know, like uh, beetroot. Okay, let's just put this here. Beetroot, it has uh, like nitrate, nitrate uh, type of compounds, and that's kind of a very sketchy thing to discuss with a lot of different pathways and, and hypotheticals but basically when you consume nitrates from from these plant foods like beetroot or whatever uh basically you you consume them and you digest them and then your intestinal bacteria after a while because it takes time to build up that intestinal bacteria when you add in this new food uh starts to convert uh these nitrates in in, in the food into uh, nitric oxide, supposedly, and this increase in nitric oxide from these from the beetroot uh, is supposed to um, improve circulation and dilate blood vessels and 
supposedly lower your risk of, of heart disease or have a beneficial effect on the cardiovascular system over time. And you'll see these beetroot supplements used in sports supplements and shit like that. Uh, you know, pre-workouts and whatnot. Um, and so, uh, yeah, those are just examples. Now, of course, you have to understand if, if these nitrates and the allicin content in the garlic actually do have such powerful, potent benefits, and I would wager that they do, they might also have negative uh, effects as well, side effects, just like pharmaceuticals. Okay, But uh, there is something known as the entourage effect in plant foods and plant medicines where uh, at, there's active compounds. They're usually standardized in standardized extracts, but in the whole food plant thing – they have these uh, other molecules in them. There's there's millions of, of, of usually unidentified molecules in these plant foods that have not been identified that have all these biologically active effects when you consume them. And the honorage effect basically is the idea that a lot of these side molecules in the plant uh, work together with the active constituents okay, that help to offset the side effects where you get nothing but – the medicinal effect without any of the side effects, okay, or at the very least with lower side effects. Another example uh, I take this is no is a as is, is the dopa the dopamine bean known as macuna purins, right? And we can talk about coffee too. So macuna purins actually has so it has a molecule known as L dopa, which is a direct precursor to dopamine, okay, and in the whole bean. It, it, it's it's generally contained in concentrations under 50% of the total content of the bean is L-DOPA. So usually you'll get, let's just say, 100 milligrams of the bean powder, but, you'll on, but only like 15 milligrams of the 100 milligrams of bean powder is actually L-DOPA. Now, when, now there's a drug that's isolated from, from Makuna – it's known as it's known as um, uh, levodopa, and it's a drug used for Parkinson's disease because Parkinson is kind of like assumed to be caused by a dopamine deficiency or dysfunction in the dopamine pathways. Uh, and so, levodopa is used to offset you know the symptoms of Alzheimer's and prolong life. However, the drug uh, levodopa is at least 99% L, actually it's 100% purified L-DOPA, okay? But the problem is you get all of the side effects you would expect from a, like a dopamine agonist drug over time. Um, things like downregulation of the dopamine receptors, uh, uh, pretty rapid tolerance needing higher dosages, uh, and then, of course, a lot of this, the, the um, you know, addictive qualities, maybe uh, burnout, depression, all sorts of things can happen as side effects from that L-DOPA, from that levodopa drug. Now, in, um, in regards to the bean that it's usually extracted from and found in, there have been so many um, supportive molecules that have been identified. There are dopamine carboxylase inhibitors that help to uh, kind of prevent the downregulation of dopamine receptors over time from the L-DOPA. There are uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors that help to kind of keep that dopamine in the circulation for a little bit longer and sustain the effects where you don't get like a crash. Uh, there are also supposedly serotonin uh, precursors and various other molecules that help to support the benefits of the L-DOPA and the Makuna bean without the negative side effects. Now, there's also protease inhibitors that inhibit the absorption of protein. So, whatever. Also, things like green tea compared to isolated caffeine. In green tea, you have um, L-theanine, which, which helps to calm you down and offset the jitters and, and the adrenaline response. You have uh, epicatechin gallate, one of the primary uh, cat catechins or, or, or uh, whatever, polyphenols, phytonutrients found in green tea that also uh, seems to have an effect on uh, caffeine's metabolism and how 
fast or slow it's metabolized in the liver, helps to balance out the, the effects, and a wide variety of other things, including vitamins and minerals that work as precursors with the l theanine to increase certain neurotransmitters and even out the buds. And coffee has similar things as well. Cafe loic acid, um, what else? Uh, certain polyphenols and theobromine and other xanthines that balance out the caffeine's effects. All right, so that was a pretty extensive but yet brief and rushed overview of polyphenols and the entourage effect. Now the thing is, in the research, you have all these people that, you know, so you have all these people that think if that if they supplement isolated freaking polyphenols and antioxidants from plants and shit, but they're taking it in like an isolated supplement form, nutraceuticals, like resveratrol supplements from red wine, yada, yada, they're going to have some kind of benefit. The fact is we don't have any evidence that those actually, we have a lot of evidence that those actually increase your risk of cancer over time. Now, Populations of people who eat the most polyphenols tend to also have higher lifespans, okay? This is wrongfully assumed that it's because they eat plant-based diets or this and that. The fact is they generally eat more protein than the average population, believe it or not. If they eat the whole animal, they also tend to eat the whole plant food and no supplements. They tend to have teas and other things like in Okinawa, they have green tea and various herbal teas. Same thing in the Mediterranean besides red wine. They drink a lot of herbal teas and medicinal teas as well with these uh, polyphenols. A lot of these polyphenols, what they do is they have a hormetic effect where they um, create a low-grade stressor below the allostatic load. Is that the word? Um, but basically below the threshold in which it is problematic, they create a low-grade stressor for your immune system and your detoxification pathways, NRF2 and, and whatnot. And uh, that low-grade stressor uh, shifts your body towards producing more endogenous antioxidants, more strengthening of the immune system, glutathione, superoxide dismutase, and they create greater... You could say, let's just say, my suspicion, cellular resilience, in air quotes, over time, okay? They create more robustness if consumed, if the right polyphenols are consumed in the right amounts over time. And uh, you look at Japan and a lot of Asian cultures, uh, Okinawa, consuming lots of tea, like green tea, green like from the Camellia sensus plant, real tea, okay? There's so many polyphenols that have been identified from there that seem to have hormetic benefits and, and cognitive benefits as well. Think the theanine and some of these other molecules, uh, the, some of the ECGC, epicatechin gallate, that seems to improve uh, neurogenesis and brain-derived neurotropic factor, which is your brain's kind of primary pep neuropeptide that is responsible for organizing the file cabinets of thoughts the stress and the other things that are usually kind of organized during sleep uh, that tend to offset dementia and promote more intelligence, great, uh, faster learning, and a greater kind of uh, ease and stress response as well, and promoting better dopamine function and motivation and mood as well. So those are all found in like tea and coffee as well. And we there's a lot of good evidence that suggests at the very least that Coffee is actually beneficial for us, especially from a longevity standpoint. And where does where's where's coffee mostly kind of come out of these days and export from? Costa Rica, okay. So in Costa Rica, what I'm saying is probably drinks a shit ton of coffee for that matter. And and there's also videos of a lot of those indigenous people killing off monkeys as a primary food source and eating eggs, bananas, and and beans as like a breakfast over there. So I'm just saying. Lifestyle and culture over there is very walk around, kind of like uh, lots of uh, manual labor and work and stuff like that. So uh, longevity <laughs> tends to be highly related to protein intake, uh, physical activity, strength training, how, how physically act active you are over time, polyphenol intake that increases the robustness of your cellular functioning and I mean we're kind of reaching the end of this video here um, but to put it simply 
Okay. E- uh, basing your diet on animal protein, eating one gram of protein per pound of ideal body weight of protein from whole animal sources to get your foundation of essential vitamins, minerals, and, 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 and essential nutrients for daily life and essential fatty acids, omega-3, EPA, and DHA is found in the fat of animals. And then, of course, getting your vitamin, either any vitamin or mineral that you're missing from that and whatever kind of energy requirement you may have. If you're an athlete like me, whatever ATP you need to create from the carbohydrates or whatever. Um, I like fruit. Um, there's a lot of polyphenols in fruit that seem to, you know, possibly improve the functioning of, of, of dopamine, brain drive, neurotropic factor. You have things like uh, uh, the, was it the 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 blue pigment in the blueberries? Okay, uh, not anxanthin or what have you, but cyan, whatever. Um, these fruits have polyphenols, the vitamins and minerals that we're missing from the meats and basically just complete the rest of our diet and they're very easy to digest they tend to be the least uh, allergenic the least likely to set off intestinal issues or autoimmune issues that are usually triggered from uh, harder to digest foods and things like that so and then of course if you want to eat like tubers and things like that and freaking brown rice you know and it doesn't cause you any negative symptoms go ahead but after you have that taken care of so the polyphenols right I think it's great to consume tonic herbs that are, you know, like reishi that have pretty significant uh, correlations with benefits to longevity and the stress response and whatnot in the immune system. I like cordyceps. I like rhodiola, um, adaptogenic herbs that seem to promote resilience and strength and endurance uh, and immunity and relaxation. Um you know, so that's a huge part of my program. Protein, freaking fruit, and then like uh, tonic herbs and polyphenols that are beneficial to your own unique case. Uh, and then, of course, strength training and uh, strength training, high intensity interval training, making sure you get enough like calcium and mineral content, whatever nutrients to promote ben- bone mineral density. Uh, and making sure that your risk factors for metabolic diseases are in check via blood tests and a knowledgeable doctor that that knows that's hip to the modern science on these things. Uh, and so, yeah, there's a lot of other things I haven't covered, but uh, I just want to get a, a very clear foundation. I think I did that. Let me know in the comments uh, what you think I might have missed or if you have any disagreements or any of that in your thoughts, and I'll talk to you all next time.